Well, amen, church. How incredible were those baptism videos? I mean, we serve a God who reaches into the darkness and saves, redeems, gives back life. Amen? I mean, how powerful, how incredible. Uh, thank you for praying for me while I was on my mission trip to the Dominican Republic. Uh, God continues to do amazing things. It was an awesome, awesome trip. Uh, thank you for your prayers. I can't wait to be able to give you uh, details ab about that. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5 as we will continue uh, our walk through the text. We'll, we'll pick up where we left off. Let me remind you. Um, just kind of setting the, the tone or frame, uh, that back in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul began uh, an articulation of the call for us to walk worthy, walk worthy of this salvation. Now that Jesus has saved you, now that he's pulled you uh, from the darkness, now that he's made you alive from the dead and he's given you so much purpose, we are called to walk worthy. And so he's, he's filled with practical instruction as we walked all the way through chapter four. And he will continue so as we pick up in chapter five, Listen as I read chapter 5, the first six verses. Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God, as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be mentioned among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no foolishness, sorry, no filthiness or foolish talk or vulgar joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person, which amounts to an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we admit and confess to you right now that that is a strong word to us this morning. But we trust you. And we trust your word that you are the one who gives life. You are the one who reaches into the darkness, who brings back from the dead. And we need to hear from you. We trust you as the king, as the creator, to teach us to think like you because we want to be like you and walk worthy of the salvation that you've given to us. Bring life out of this passage. Give us your warning, but speak life. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> On March 16th, 2021, just a couple months ago, Aaron Long uh, went into three different spas in the Atlanta, Georgia area and killed eight people. Aaron struggled with a sex addiction. He had tremendous guilt from visiting these spas, and he came back to open fire. What you see on your screen is a testimony from 2018 in a sister Baptist church about how Aaron had been saved and professed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. His classmates, his youth group, all of were shocked. He was such a nice, calm, sweet guy. How could this be? I share that with you as a warning 
of the dark, dark path that awaits, that you can go down with sexual immorality. You say, Pastor, that's unfair. You have cherry-picked an improper example. Well, then shall we all spend time mourning the fall of Ravi Zacharias and the great shame and harm that his sins have done to the name of Christ? You see, our culture is thoroughly confused about sexuality. And I could stand up here and I could share with you story after story after news story that our grandparents never dreamed would ever be part of our reality. One after another, for rampant porn addiction to gender confusion to odd and perverse lifestyles, it's a runaway train and it's about to run off the tracks, which simply reminds us of our enormous need and responsibility for Christians who know God, who know their creator, the inventor of sex, to speak with clarity and to bring light into darkness. We have a tremendous challenge this morning that is going to require a great deal of maturity from you. It is our charge as we look at the text. The question is, is where do we begin? I begin with the amazing reminder that God is the inventor, the creator of sex. He is the one who purposed it and made it enjoyable and powerful. Think with me for a moment. He could have made procreation as mundane as bumping elbows but he didn't. The one, the God who makes food taste good and makes music stir your soul, he is the one who has made our bodies. And he is also the one who has set the parameters for sex inside the confines of marriage. One man and one woman within marriage. Now listen to me, the historical reality and clarity of the Bible's sexual ethic is obvious and clear. I know there will be certain groups who want to pick apart certain words and try and wiggle and move around to try and justify their own sexual ethics. We will save those debates for another time, but the simple reality, I cannot say it, it is abundantly clear within the scripture that God has created sex for inside of marriage, one man, one woman, not before marriage, not outside of marriage. Christianity has the highest sexual ethic of any world religion, by far, because it is God who has given this beautiful, amazing gift. But like fire, it must be set in the confines of a fireplace or else you were burn down the entire house. There are two lies I need to quickly address this morning that the culture our culture wants to speak simultaneously. Those two lies are that sex is nothing and sex is everything. Sex is nothing. This is the claim of our culture. It's just a physical activity. It can be casual. It can mean absolutely nothing. No strings attached. We can just kind of have some friends with benefits sort of thing. The Bible says abundantly that that is an absolute lie. That the creator the inventor of sex, not only made it a connection of bodies, not only for procreation and for life, but has also designed it to be a spiritual union. That it is not nothing. The only way that you can make sense of Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, okay, is to understand that there is a spiritual power and connection, a union that is supposed to take place within the sexual union. You see, apparently, uh, some believers in Corinth were arguing in much the same way that our culture does today. That is, hey, what's the big deal? It's just physical exercise. 
To which Paul replies, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For the Bible says the two shall become one flesh. The one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is inside the body. But the immoral or sexually immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So sex is not nothing. God has made, the creator has made sex to be physical, emotional, and a spiritual union. All three. Sex is not nothing. Simultaneously, our culture wants to say sex is everything. If I can't express my sexual passions, then I will never be fulfilled. This is a scary runaway train of our culture. They say, if you love me, you must approve of all my desires. And not just allow me the freedom to do them, but rather I need you to affirm them. And this is the dark corner that our culture has painted itself into. Because when everything becomes man-centered, everything becomes passion-driven. But everyone has passions that are not good for them and should not be acted upon. Everyone does. You lead your passions into the truth of God's word. You don't let them run wild doing whatever you want. But suddenly, culturally, the most unloving thing you can say is that's not God's design for you. To which I would reply, is it unloving to say, do not put oil in the gas tank for the car was not made that way? Is it loving to let you drink the water in the Dominican Republic? Even the locals don't drink the water in the Dominican Republic. Is it loving to give a child all the candy, all the toys, whatever he wants? See, the truth of the matter is, is God has so much more for you than simply your sexual desires and passions. They don't define you. Christ does. And if he has called you to be single and celibate, praise God, then you are like Jesus. You are like the apostle Paul. Your passions don't define you. The entire movement of the book of Ephesians is that you are now in Christ. He defines you. But lest we spend all of our time this morning talking about how far off course that the culture has gone, and we comfortably amen how bad everything is, they are truly not the aim of our passage today. You are, because God is calling the Christian to be different from the world. Different, called out ones. It's important that you and I realize that we are not alone in being called out to live different from a highly sexualized context. Sexual attitudes in the ancient Roman Reco world were very much like today, and in some cases were even more blatant. Prostitution, homosexuality, bisexuality were common. Slaves were often abused sexually. Often a double standard existed between husbands and wives, where the husband was allowed to be much more promiscuous, where a wife was not. The Roman bathhouses were common places for licentiousness. In ancient Ephesus, where Paul writes, certainly partook 
There is one of the signs that remained left over from ancient Ephesus that still shows uh, sailors as they came in the ancient port and pointed the way towards the brothels. Ephesus was also the home of the temple of Artemis, the Greek goddess of fertility. You see, much of the ancient world idolatry was wrapped up with sexuality. All this to say, God is calling us as Christians to a higher ethic, to his design. Now, what's important, what you need to know is that the early church had a reputation within the Roman Empire of being different, of not walking the way that the Romans walk. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you an article, an ancient writing called The Apology of Aristides, the philosopher, where he wrote to Caesar, and he was arguing, trying to articulate to Caesar about how different the Christians were. Previously, I showed you and I highlighted areas about how it talked about Christians' love, how Christians uh, even purchased slaves, they purchased their freedoms. And if, and if someone was extremely poor and they could not afford a burial, that the Christians would gather their money together and make sure there were proper burials. They were doing all of these things together in love. I also want to read a section from you so that you can realize again the testimony of early Christians and their completely different sexual ethic from the Roman culture. He writes and he talks about how uh, they trust in the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, and he has put his laws upon our hearts. Then he writes, wherefore, they do not commit adultery nor fornication, nor bear false witness, nor embezzle what is held in pledge, nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother. They show kindness to those who are near to them. And whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. To their oppressors, they comfort and they make them their friends. They do good to their enemies and their women, O king, are pure as virgins and their daughters are modest and their men keep themselves from every unlawful union and from every form of uncleanliness and the hope of recompense to come in the other world. Ephesians chapter five, verse three. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as it is proper among the saints. The first word that Paul uses here, pornea, the common term that where we get pornography, is a broad term meaning sexual immorality. The word can be used to condemn fornication, but here the context is much more general. Now, the next two words that Paul uses, impurity and greed, in other contexts can mean exactly how they're defined, but here, because they are used in tandem as a three-part together, with the first one being sexual immorality, it is Paul's way of saying any and all sexual sins. Very similar list to what he lists in Colossians 3, 5. Any impurity you can think of, any greediness, the reason that he adds greediness to this list is because he's talking about the fact that the passions of the heart, that they always thirst and they're never satisfied. You're not supposed to read this list and go, oh good, he didn't mention mine. He's referring to the entire biblical sexual ethic. Christians are not to adopt the sexual ethic of the day, but rather are to be holy as our God is holy. But he doesn't stop there. He immediately presses into the way that Christians speak about sex. 
Verse 4, there must be no filthiness or foolish talk or vulgar joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. You see, because Paul knows that in a sexually explicit culture, the most common way that morals are eroded over time is through the use of humor. Approaching taboo subjects in jest is a way of desensitizing it. Locker room talk. Filthy, vulgar joking. I remember in high school, this is the way boys joke, pretending to be big and bad, joking about subjects long before they had ever approached any of it. But don't you see, that's where it always starts. Now, don't for a second think that the Bible is against good humor. The devil would want nothing more than for you to think that God is a cosmic party pooper, that he doesn't laugh, that he doesn't enjoy humor. That's not the prohibition here. The prohibition is completely against sexually inappropriate and vulgar humor. These things must not even be named amongst us. Now, is that the case? in your home, with your real friends. Could Jesus watch TV with you? Does your social media glamorize what God hates? I'm afraid if we Christians are honest, we suffer from what Kent Hughes calls the cookie jar syndrome. You see, a little boy's mother baked cookies, chocolate chip cookies, and made them for uh, for dessert. And the whole house filled with the aroma as she put the cookie jar, uh, the cookies in the jar. And she called Johnny. She said, "Look, I'm putting these cookies in the jar. They are for your dessert. They will be waiting for you, but you must not touch them until after dinner. I don't want you to spoil your dinner." Well, 20 minutes later, she could hear the clanking of the glass cookie jar, to which she hollers out, son, son, what are you doing? To which he replies, my hand is in the cookie jar resisting temptation. (laughs) Beloved, your father loves you. He always gives good instruction. Do you not realize that dark clouds slowly roll in on a gentle breeze while one confidently asserts his ability to stop looking at any time? Satan seeks a foothold in your life with partial truths and hidden consequences. He invites you to escape reality where your passions reign and everything else fades away. How many times before you has it been said, I never meant to destroy my family, my marriage, my reputation. But here's the stone cold reality. Everything hidden will come to light. For this you know with certainty, that no sexually immoral or impure person or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. See that no one deceives you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Everyone wants to know, pastor, How close to the edge can I walk and still be saved? Pastor, I'm living with my girlfriend. I know it's wrong, but, you know, I'm a Christian. I've asked Jesus to be my Savior. I've got the T-shirt to prove it. Situation after situation. 
fornication, adultery, homosexuality, pornography, 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 and more pornography. And they want to hug from Scripture that tells them, keep doing what you're doing because Jesus loves you. It's just fine. See that no one deceives you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You don't like that? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor swindles will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. But you've been washed. You've been sanctified. God has purchased you and cleaned you and redeemed you so that you could walk out in newness of life. Now, some of you will hear this sermon and you will be filled with guilt. You will begin to grit your teeth and you will begin to say, all right, I will do better. It reminds me of a story in ancient Greek mythology of the siren songs. And Odysseus is an adventurer. And he knows that when you go by the siren's island, that they sing a song that causes, that is so beautiful that it causes the sailors to want to. They must turn and, and go towards the island. It is captivating and it kills everyone who goes by. So Odysseus has a plan. He sticks beeswax in every one of his sailors' ears. But he wants to hear the song so bad that he has them tie him up on the mast. Tie him up and don't listen to anything that he says, no matter what happens. And so as they are going along, Odysseus is up and he begins to hear the siren's song and he screams out and he hollers and he fights, listen to me, turn towards the rocks. And he fights with everything that he has and he's tied up on the mast and he can see the sirens as beautiful angels. Unbeknownst to him, the sailors who cannot hear see them as green monsters or violent and are waiting to devour and to eat all who come by. So many of us feel like resisting sexual temptation, like Odysseus, strapped to a mass, fighting, weary, helpless. You see, but there is a better way because there's another sailor who comes along. His name is Orpheus. And as he gets close to the mountain, he pulls out his string and lyre, and he begins to play a better song, better music. And they are able to just completely pass by. Listen to me. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. The letter of the law kills but the Spirit of God gives life. This entire book of Ephesians is gospel dripping life. Even the instructions that are given here are life. All across this room, if all the statistics hold up, and I'm certain that they do, there are those who are ensnared by our various levels of sexual sin. But listen to me. There is hope. Yes, Jesus has a high sexual ethic, 
But he never leaves you there. There is hope. He will save you and redeem you and pull you out and give you the strength and the hope to walk out. Look at what Paul says right here at the end of verse 4. Look at the end of verse 4. Because all in the midst of resisting sexual temptation that I must not be named among you, at the end of verse 4, rather he says, fill your heart with thanksgiving. Why? Because there is a normal sexual appetite, good passions, but then there is the beast that we feed that grows from a cat into a roaring lion. And so often, our out-of-control sexual desires are a symptom of selfish, discontent heart. I want you to see the tie. I want you to see the answer that he gives because he says fighting this immorality is tied to being filled with thanksgiving. Rather, fill your heart with thanksgiving. You say, what do I have to be thankful for? Every spiritual blessing. Right? Isn't that where this entire book began? Isn't Ephesians filled with life? Isn't it the gospel? Doesn't it fill your soul with purpose that he has chosen you from the foundation of the world, that you have been adopted as children of God, that you have been redeemed, that he has revealed a purpose for you, that you walk out in newness of life, that you have a path to go, that you've obtained an inheritance that's waiting for you in heaven that will not fade away, the true riches that last eternally, and you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And he's awoken you from the dead and he's made us a church to gather together the living temple and he's given us purpose and he's given us passion. He's given us so much to live for. Therefore, be filled up with good things, with thanksgiving and do not let sexual immorality even be named among us. That's the charge. See, the whole first part of the sermon, there's this weightiness, this weightiness. I can't believe the pastor is saying such hard things. Why is the scripture so difficult? We need to hear these things. It's the truth of our culture. Just turn on the evening news, night after night after night. We are called to be different. We are the called out ones. Secondly, as a church, We must create safe spaces. You see, the further our culture goes down this runaway train track, the more they need us to meet them where they are with the gospel. Isn't that the truth of the gospel? They don't clean up before they come in. Might be messy at the door. You get to see incredible baptism videos. Do you think it was that nice and neat and easy at the beginning? When they were in the darkness? We must meet them where they are. The gospel always does. So this is the maturity that I called us to the very beginning. We have an incredibly high moral sexual ethic that we're always striving towards where I can press you about what's on your phone and what's on your TV and all of those things. And simultaneously, we must engage the culture where they are. We are a hospital for the hurting. We are the ones who have life. Jesus is the one who pulls out of darkness. What this means is that we cannot be prudish in our conversation. We cannot get embarrassed about it. They need dialogue. They need to be able to work through some of their confusion. Who is going to meet them with the truth of of, uh, sexual ethics, if, if not us? Should, should, should we turn the next generation over to the public schools and to whatever they find on social media? Should we just turn it loose? Who is going to meet them if we don't? And help them work through the confusion, all of the issues, to be patient, to have honest dialogue, 
to kindly and lovingly share the truth of God's word. Simultaneously knowing that the moment you accept Christ, it doesn't magically change everything. Who's going to walk them to Jesus? I'll never forget hearing the testimony of a singer-songwriter, Dennis Jernigan. It was back when I was in seminary, he came to Wedgwood Baptist Church and he spent the morning with us and he shared his testimony. He struggled with same-sex attraction. Then he heard the good news of Jesus Christ through a friend. And as he was having candid conversations with that friend about what it meant to accept Jesus and how to deal with his passions and all of what that meant, he asked his friend, what, what do I do? To which his friend was just simple and honest and said, you know what, I don't know, but I know this. I'll walk with you as we walk towards Jesus. I'll walk with you as we walk towards Jesus. I pray that that's our church. I pray that we are a hospital to the hurting. I pray that we have the courage and the sensitivity to be used by God so that we get to experience incredible testimonies like what you heard this morning. For we were all lost in darkness. We were all blind, but now we see. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, We trust you. Your word is good. Your word is right. Your word is direct. It deals with the issues of the human heart. It does not skirt. It does not play church and pretend. Father, I know all across this room there are those who struggle. And they need you to not only convict their heart, but to lift their head. To allow them to see the hope of your freedom. Father, I pray that we as a church would be that hospital. That you would use us that you would keep us strong, but you would keep us sensitive. Jesus, we wanna walk worthy. We know that our sin separates us from you. Help us. Help us to run to the cross over and over again and to find life. And Jesus, to find that your song is better. It's in your name we pray. Amen.